Okay, we're up, we're up, we're up. Three minutes late. My God, the world is coming to an end. Absolutely. <laughs> Sorry about that, gang. A few things happening all at the same time here this morning. <sighs> relax, relax, relax. Okay, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful blue sky. Anybody with any sense this morning is out there walking around, hiking around, enjoying the weather outside. Anybody with any grain of sense. Good morning. <laughs> Oh hi yo, oh hi yo, oh hi yo. Okay, we're gonna be carving, 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 carving. There's some good news and bad news about this block. We're gonna keep carving. We're on her headdress. I'm not gonna get to the face yet today, but we're on her headdress. I'll do a bit of carving this morning. So I don't know where the weather is where you are, but if you're in Tokyo, you shouldn't be sitting here watching a stream. You should be out walking. Okay, there's been lots and lots and lots of thick squiggle. <laughs> it's just so much going on. <laughs> We're having a ton of fun, but there is so much going on. Good stuff, difficult stuff. But there's just so much going on. The paper is out. Three, three packs. Three packs. Uh, Lei Chan, she is doing the last, the last color. She's doing the Yuge color on the final group of prints of the December subscription series. I said last time that she was finished. She wasn't. She has one more to do. She has to do it on dry papers, which confused me. I saw her paper had been, uh, had been dried. So. so she's doing the yuge on that one. Uh, Suga-san is doing something. I don't remember. I just pulled her paper out. It's all there waiting on the stack. I don't remember what she's doing. She's doing a job. And then Aimee san's here. She's doing, uh, my God, I don't know what she's doing either. I don't remember. Whatever. I pulled, I pulled the packs of paper out, stumbled back down the stairs. Three printers here today. So. Okay, let's find the location. Get zoomed in. One sec. Actually, before I zoom in, something else to show you then. Just a minute. Let's zoom out a bit. Something else to show you. You see a, a mark here with an X on it. It's the space that is set aside for the calligraphy. I haven't actually traced the calligraphy yet, but on this image, there is calligraphy explaining who this is. It's, uh, no, it's a kanon. I can't remember the first two characters, but it's just explaining that this is kanon sama. I think this is the Chinese character rendition of the, the maybe the basic Hin Buddhist name for, for, the, for the character. But what I had forgotten, and I have, this is a screw-up here, this is a major screw-up, what I had forgotten is that there was also characters down at the bottom. Some of them, it's Heaven's Waterfall, I think it's perhaps it's a name for the dragon, I'm not sure, I haven't really e explored it yet, I don't know. But anyway, there's characters down at the bottom, and I had forgotten about that. And when I was clearing around this dragon area, I had chiseled away a bunch of wood down at the bottom here. You can see I was chiseling away, and I took out the area where the top two characters need to appear. I've got my order of jobs here a little bit mixed up. So yesterday afternoon, we were, the shop here was busy, actually quite busy, but during the busyness of yesterday afternoon, I popped another piece of boxwood in there. It looks a bit messy now, but you'll see once we get it shaved off and get it down there, it'll look okay. And this was actually quite easy to do. It just took a few minutes because we've got boxwood here, a really thin layer. It's about a two millimeter layer of boxwood on top of plywood. So to do an inlay like this is really, really, really simple. I just grabbed, you can see what's going on here, of a neighboring wood block. This is something to do with two boys and a sharpening stone, uh, and a calligraphy stone. I just chopped a square piece, popped it off, cut a hole, and put it inside. 
So we'll, we're back to normal. We can carve our calligraphy on this thing. And if I'd known it was going to be so simple, I would have just done it on stream, but whatever, I had it done yesterday. Oh, somebody's really reading our characters here. You've got them here, have you? As I said, these two, it's okay. I've got these two. This is Kanon. I know those. We have here locally in, in Sensoji. There's a Kanon Sama up at the temple here. And the, the older two here, has somebody got these for me? Oh, so he's got it. Yedu Chao. The first two I can't read. And then at the bottom, we have what seems to be I don't know, Heaven's Waterfall, and then e night, evening, I don't know. Someone's got it, Tatsugashira. So it's ta Tatsugashira, okay. Yeah, then it would be literally, if it's Tatsugashira, if it's dragon head, obviously it's the Kanon-sama sitting on a dragon head. There's, no, there's nothing complicated about that then. Sorry, just too many strokes for my memory to be able to pull up. But yes, simple then, dragon's head Kanon. The, Bodha Vista sitting on a dragon's head, yes. Are the ninja guys getting set up there? It's a bit dark over there, it's hard to see, they're in the shadow so much. He does some exercise out there some morning. Is that what he was doing? Out there waving his arms around or waving his sword around? I don't know. He, they exercise out there sometimes. And they sometimes do their play fights. Two of the guys, if there's no customers, they will stand out there with their plastic swords and they slash away at each other. They were doing that yesterday afternoon. So I think I should be getting a silver envelope in the next few days, a silver envelope. We'll stand by. I got though, I've got to say, there's been so much going on here the last couple of days. I, know, I posted a link a few minutes ago just before the stream started. And I should post it again, I guess, for those of you who haven't seen it. This is something that's been going, oops, not that one. Oops, 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 not that one. Top secret information there. I posted a link to a conversation we've been having with one of the new bots, the new chat bots. If you've got nothing else to do here while watching this, you can take a look at that conversation. It was good, good, good fun. It is turning out to be good, good, good fun. Well, the first print. Not the one for your book. It's okay. I'll look forward to see it. Crafter guy 70, uh, 78, 73. Fine. Thank you. Is it okay to open it on stream? If, if, if you don't say no, I'll probably open it on stream. We'll see. If it's okay by you. All right. Let's get this going here. Let's get this going. I think we're zoomed in a bit too close. I'm not going to be able to keep it on camera. Okay, stand by, thank you.
can't find my tools. Did you see that one? So evaluate the position of Dave Ball. I can't believe the fact, the fake news that it put in there. It says, this is worrying now. Who is it confusing me with? I have no idea. If you've read that link that we've passed on there, this is insane. I just rolled on the floor. I mean, there's this expression, R-O-F-L. I just did that when I read that thing. I was enjoying to read the first sentence, second sentence, third sentence. It's all, yeah, this is cool. And then I got to that part about the Royal Academy. And give me a break. I just fainted. The grain on this block, it's, it's okay. I haven't been complaining about it. It's really quite a good, nice, smooth piece of boxwood. and uh, Nobody would complain about the grain on here. But actually, there is one like this one. There is part of the grain here that's actually making this a bit difficult to work. Although it looks smooth and straight, the grain on this one is actually angled down quite deeply. And when it's unavoidable to cut in a certain way, like this way, we're going, actually, the grain's going way down, and it's really... I have to be really careful not to pop stuff off. This block wants to slice this way. So when I'm doing this part, no problem. But to come around the other way and do this one, we're now carving, I know, sort of downhill, as it were. The grain direction is going down into the wood. And if I try and slice across, it actually wants to go deeper and deeper and deeper. We want it to go the other way. We'd like it to just lift up. But because of the direction of the cutting, you know, you can't always cut the direction you'd like to go. That kind of stuff really screwed me around in the early days when I couldn't understand how the wood was structured, you know. Now you can see it within seconds of getting into a block. You can, you can tell where the grain is and which way it goes in any particular area. But yeah, that grain slopes right down. open. Actually, your guess is as good as mine. We really can't tell. You know, I don't have a super enlargement to show you at the moment. I won't be able to zoom in. Her eyes on this original sketch, her eyes are nothing but a blur. And they're, they're actually quite different. The, her right eye is really just a, a blurred blob. I can't zoom in close enough. Later on, as part of the videos and stuff for this series, I'll be, I'll be zooming in really close and showing you. Her face is an actual mess. Whoever tried to draw her nose, Hoksai, I guess, he tried once, oops, twice, three, four times. It's a blur of lines. Her right eye is just a blob. Her left eye is sort of a shape. And when I did the tracing for this, I had to just recreate what I thought was a sensible nose and a sensible eye on each side. So the lines you're going to see in this print are, 
our Dave Bull traced on top of a Hoxai concept picture. We'll be really going into this in great detail in the video series that talks about these. It's not going to be a video for print number one, print number two, print number three. It's going to be a series of videos that, like we did with the Great Wave, that explore a lot of things step by step. And the other part about it that I haven't talked about in the net, on the net yet, is that different carvers are going to be doing this. I'm doing number one, Sean Sen's doing number two, Asuka Sen's doing number three, and we're all tracing it ourselves. So this print series is going to represent the different taste and different approach of three different carvers who are not just carving a different way, but they're looking at these lines and saying, no, I don't think I should go there. I think that should go here. I'm going to fix that this way. And Chonsan's philosophy is to fix as little as possible. Dave's philosophy is to make this look as much like a Hokusai print as possible. And Asuka Sensei is going to fall somewhere in the middle, I think. So I have fixed lots, and Chon San is on his side. He said, you can't do that. And I've said, oh, yes, I can. Hoxai's dead. I'm the one here with the brush. This is my job. And I had no choice. There was no eye. Her right eye was just a blob. So like it or not like it, I had to draw an eye. Luckily, I got 40 years of experience at this drawing and carving ukiyo-e type eyes. I have no idea what's going on up there. It sounds like destruction. Somebody's breaking something up, are they? Can we see it? No idea what's going on out there. It must be happening in the other direction. The light installers are dropping the balls. <laughs> Maybe I don't know. <laughs> There's never, ever a dull moment on this street. There is always stuff going on out there, you know.
conversation here. Oh, some information here. The characters at the bottom. Okay, I'll drink this in later. Actually, I think I remember something about that on the on the British Museum website. Yes, thanks for the info. I'll catch this later. I'll drink this in later. Thank you. As this series goes on through the year, I myself, I'm not going to pontificate and give information about the characters and things that we're seeing. Along with each print that we send out during the year, during a couple of years, there will be a small pamphlet that the prints are not going to go out bare. They're going to go out in a folder with a small uh, episode slash story. So I'll be talking about the, the print production process in those stories. I won't be talking about the history of the characters. I'm simply going to refer people to the British Museum website because those guys have the, uh, the research knowledge about the content of these things that I don't have. Ah, the blade. Yeah, 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 yeah. There is. There's, it's a multiple bevel of this. It's one, two, three. There's four bevels on the blade. I was wondering how much I could talk about this. Okay. Those of you, you you're getting this. I have. There's a different sharpen on this. There's an... Not sure how to talk about this. Okay, there we are. There's sort of the main bevel, but the main bevel Part of it is knocked back. If I get this shiny, just a minute. You can see the shape there, the main bevel, and then at the back end of the bevel, it's, I don't know what word to use, it's, it's knocked back, it's beveled again. Here you go. There's a second shape to it. And then in addition to this, I have knocked back again. There you are, look at this. See the shiny part there? I've knocked back the corner. We were having trouble. This thing was breaking and breaking and breaking and breaking. I wonder if I can find a place on the camera here. Where am I? Okay. Sample A, a knife with our bevel. This angle if I made it quite acute to go around the corners, we got huge breakage. If I made it too obtuse so it didn't break, I couldn't get around the corners. So what I've done is this, and I, I, I've remembered this before, but I should have applied it a bit earlier on this. Here's your angle, maybe a bit more acute. There's your angle. There's the bevel. From just behind the tip here, up to this point. 
I beveled this area back again, just behind the tip. So the tip doesn't change. If I just at this point took it and started carving, nothing would change. The tip would still break. But then I also beveled here. So we have the main bevel, a secondary bevel, and a third, if I can call it a bevel, it's just I took it, oops, took it away. Let's try and draw this again. Bevel number one, sharpen it. From this point to here, knock it back some more. And then from that point here, take the knife on the sharpening stone, the back of the sharpening stone, like this, and take away the actual tip. So then the shape you have left is something like this. I'm exaggerating this. It's something like this. This is the end result of the shape. This is the back side of the knife. This is the front side of the knife. There's your main blade. And this is exaggerated. This angle is exaggerated. You've cut this back and there's a bevel here. And that gives you a tip, which is sort of a, like a triangular pyramid tip, and it doesn't break. Since I did that the other day, and I've sharpened it a couple of times since then, since I did that, it has never broken. And I should have gone back and done this a bit earlier. The downside, and there is a downside, again, this is exaggerated, is this angle is almost like here, it's almost 90 degrees, so it's not very fine. You can't really go around little tiny circles. With, the angle isn't that bad. The actual angle is something, something less. It's still quite acute. I don't remember, I was chatting with a carver one day somewhere a million years ago about different ways to do this. It might have been Asuka Sensei, I don't remember. I didn't invent this or design this or whatever. It's just, it's another way that it's done. If Taran-san is watching here, he will perhaps know about this as well. And the key one here is knocking back, knocking back that point. I mentioned earlier how I took away that bit of wood there where the calligraphy is supposed to go. I made a mistake and I cut away too much wood. 
we've got something similar happening here now up near the head. I've got to really be careful here not to take away too much wood. Let me show you here. Let me get the original. We've got her face here. In the original design, you can see there's a darker area here. This is, I guess, hair, or the top of her hair, that's showing under her headdress. Her headdress and her cloth comes like this. You can see the pattern of the, of the, of the fabric comes in and around. And then there's the lotus flower thing sitting on top of her head. And then we've got this darker area here and part of the way down the side of her face. And this is her hair, and it's going to be on the key block. So it has to stay. I've got it here. The lines are drawn. And this part down here. Remember, it's, we're, we're reversed here. This is, this is flipping down. So this part right beside her cheek here has to stay black. And this part just above the top of her forehead, which represents her hair or, or a headdress of some kind, has to stay black. So I've got to remember not to cut those out. If it's sharp and stable for a long time, why not go the extra mile? Because I lose, I lose acuteness. It cuts it back. It's not as acute an angle as we would really, really like. It's that same compromise. If the angle is too acute, it will break. If it's too obtuse, you can't go around corners. And this is sort of a, by putting this extra bevel on the back, it gives you a bit of fatness at the blade at the tip. It's sort of still semi-acute, but it's a bit fatter than it would be if it was just the edge of your normal sharpening. Hard to describe, but there's, there's more bulk to the metal at the tip at that point, but definitely you lose, you, you've lost uh, acuteness by knocking off the back there. So I'm checking my saying pencil it in. Actually, I did pencil it in. I put some small dots on there and they have been sort of rubbing away while I've been uh, carving. So I have, I'm, I'm pretty on this right now. I put some little dots in there. But as my hand goes over the block back and forth, they've been uh, rubbed away, so.
Okay, when I get this little bit finished here, just a moment, when I get the corner of this headdress done, something I want to show you and something I want to mention about what happened yesterday. We had a bunch of really, really, really interesting visitors yesterday that, that, uh, that blew my socks off. We had visitors yesterday and one of them, he gave me a little present, a little Christmas present. And I, I, will, I will never have socks again. <laughs> They've been blown so far away. It was a really, really, really fun day in the shop yesterday. You, know? you never know what's going to happen when people walk in the door. You know? It really is slowing down now. We're in the mid-December slow period. We've, we learned this from our shop back in the old days, pre-corona. Asakusa tourism, or Japan tourism in general, there's two massive peak periods each year. There's the, the cherry season, the spring season, when the weather is congenial. And there's the autumn season. You know, it's partly for autumn maple leaf viewing, and partly because, again, the weather is congenial. It's not too cold and it's not too hot. Midsummer is not a great time to visit Japan, and midwinter neither is. So we've got the spring and the autumn seasons in a normal year. This year's a bit different because, you know, it's, it's recovery from the pandemic and there's a lot of built-up demand. But having said that, there still is the same similar pattern, spring and autumn. Then in addition to that, there's another mini peak that happens towards the end of the year. And this is not specific about Japan. Nobody would come here to enjoy their Christmas. But what happens is people in many other countries, they get a winter break. So there may be they're off from 23rd of December or something through the end of the year. So it's a chance for people in those cultures to travel. So we get another third boom or boomlet or whatever you say here in Japan of tourism at the end of the year. And this starts around the 22nd or 23rd of December when people's holidays over there start. Now, there's no specific reason to come to Japan at the 23rd or 4th of December. Christmas is nothing here. But as I said, it's based on the holidays over there. So long story short, right now, this two weeks in the middle of December, or the early part of December up to the 20th, the first few weeks of December is traditionally really quiet in the tourist business here. I mean, there are tourists, but it's not one of your, one of your, your peaks before the year-end bubble starts. So we're in the quiet time right now. It's not as quiet as a normal year because of that pent-up demand, and there's a lot more people here in a normal year. So in the middle of this yesterday, we've got a few casual visitors. Somebody's coming in, a YouTube viewer says, hello, how are you doing? Somebody, a few people from Britain came in, a couple from Australia, New Zealand. We had a good variety of stuff. Anyway, in the middle of all this, in the middle of all this, four young guys walk in yesterday. They come in the door, and three of them are Japanese, and one is a young man, uh, he's, he turned out to be European, from, from Ireland. They walk in the door, and right away, we've talked about this before, right away I can tell whether they're completely random people who just walk in off the street, or whether they are people who know us. Because people who walk in off the street, they sort of have a sort of a, a standard neutral face, they look around, oh this is nice, and they come into the shop. People who know us, who've been watching the YouTube videos, whatever, he comes in, they see me, and right away, above the mask, you can see the eyes light up, the eyes shine. This person, he's been waiting to get here, and he knows where he's going. So this, this group of four people come in the door. I see this young man, I see his eyes light up, and now we can have some fun. You know, who are you, how are you doing? I know you've seen the YouTube videos, I guess, and you know, he says, yes, yes, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. Something special about this group. We chat a little bit about, he's talking about, love your videos, love your videos, whatever, 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 extra. But then, you know, I am not sitting here talking about my own work. I don't want to talk about the same stuff all the time. So, of course, I ask the people who are visiting what's going on. And sometimes I do this by asking where they're from. I've heard them talk for, for 15 seconds here. So I would say something like, am I hearing, uh, I'm hearing Great Britain here, right? And I think that's probably what I said to this young man yesterday. And he said, I'm from Ireland. <laughs> so it's, uh, sometimes you have to be careful. You might say, you're from Australia, and they're gonna, their face will go cold, and they'll say, New Zealand, but whatever. So this guy, anyway, he's from, from, from Ireland, and he smiles and happy. And uh, we get talking a bit more, and I ask him, what do you do? And he drops a bombshell on me. If I asked you to quiz you this, you know, what's this person doing, it would mean nothing to have you quiz. People are all over the world. They do accounting. We had a couple yesterday. He was a financial analysis or something. This guy drops an absolute bomb. I have never, ever, ever heard an answer like this. I ask him, what do you do? And he says, well, me and the team here, 
and he pauses because he doesn't want to sort of be too, be too, I know, braggy here. He pauses and he tells me, well, this is the team, the four of us, we built the lunar lander that is currently on the way to the moon. And they work for iSpace. And the lunar lander that they built is, you probably haven't heard this news because that company is so bad at self-promotion. You all heard about the Artemis project, the massive rocket. You saw the pictures, you saw they dominated the news for weeks. At the moment, a company called iSpace has a lunar lander. It's on the way to the moon right now. It's going to orbit way out for a while, come back to the moon and attempt a landing. And it has on board, it's got a rover made by a different company in the United Ar Ar Arabic U UAR. And it's got a little tiny dinky round rover from a Japanese company, which is going to be popped out onto the surface. These four guys built that thing. And I, I just, I went, I just, whatever, smoke came out of my ears. I jumped up and started chatting. I got a billion questions for these guys. Forget the other customers in the shop, whatever. We had so much fun. They're young. Like this guy's maybe 38, 39, I don't know, the three Japanese guys with him. I had lots of criticism for these guys. How come my YouTube channel has more viewers than your YouTube channel? What get to work on your promotion? And he says, it's out of my hands. We're just the engineers. We're the clean room guys. We build this stuff and we've watched it go. He's got nothing to do with the promotion or the business or anything like that. Then he reaches into his pocket and he says, I got something here. Maybe and he, he tries to give me something and he gives me the mission badge, SpaceX Falcon 9, that was the launch vehicle. They, they, they got a ride on the Falcon 9 that went up so it's eight, seven days ago. They went up on Sunday, Japanese time, a week ago. Nobody ever knew it in the news, but a Falcon 9 went up, and I guess it did the usual SpaceX satellite stuff, but also on there was this lander. And I have the mission badge iSpace M1, the mission, which at the moment is on the way to the moon. Nothing to do with me, of course, but wow, what a cool, this has got to be one of the best Christmas presents I have ever had in my entire life. Fantastic. And they were good guys. The, the Japanese guys didn't chat so much. They explained a little bit, answered some questions. But I grabbed this guy and I wouldn't let go. <laughs> It's just whatever. At some point, I guess, maybe you can see in his eyes, he's sort of like, I, I'm, I'm asking too many questions, I'm driving him too much, and like he did, you know, want to look around and look at some prints and stuff, so, uh, so whatever. No, there's no people in this. It's a lunar lander. This is a box. And what this company's doing, they're not going to be carrying people back and forth at all. Look it up. It's iSpace. I've got a link for you. Give me a sec. I've got a link to their little web page that nobody notices and the world hasn't seen and just... Uh, don't get me upset about this. The project, it's, it's one of these multi-projects. One of the little uh, rovers inside the lander is Japanese. It's a JAXA project. The ride was a SpaceX ride. Uh, his company, I guess it's a, it's a venture capital company. I know, I think they have a European. I think they built this thing. They were in Germany. They actually built it in Germany, I believe. It's, it's a real mix of European space agency and all these kind of things got together. And this company, and I had no idea about this. This company has a contract with NASA to do transport. They are going to be a trucking company that carries payloads, rovers, uh, science experiments, whatever, that carries payloads between the Earth and the coming moon projects, the coming moon colony. And these guys actually have an outline for putting a sim simple colony on the moon by 2040. So look up, go to that website, take a look. And he then, he did something. I can't share this with you. I'm really sorry I can't share this with you. I don't even have it. He just showed it to me and wouldn't let me have this. He pulls out his phone and he showed me a picture that they received X hours ago. This thing, as it's on its way to the moon, of course, it's got telemetry. It's sending back photographs. And it's sending back photographs of the Earth as it's on its way to the moon. Now, from the Artemis project last month, we got a couple of dinky little is a blue dot photographs. They really weren't done well at all. These guys have done it. There's a 
gorgeous, gorgeous photograph with the tail end of their spacecraft and the Earth, big blue Earth floating there, and my jaw dropped to the floor. Why isn't this? And he says, no, I can't. It's not to anything to do with me. Just I got a copy of it. You'll have to talk to the boss, whatever. And the world doesn't even know about this. That's how blasé now space has become. There's a freaking lunar lander on the way, and nobody even knows about it. I don't believe these guys are talking about Mars. This company is the, everything on their website that I saw. It's, it's Elon and his, his fantasies are about Mars. This is about the moon, which to me is a far, 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 far more sensible thing to do. Get some stuff on the moon. It's close. We can stage. You can send up extra missions. Mars is just, it's a bridge too far. Anyway, there it is. That, that's Dave's news for the day. And I'm going to, I just, you know, I couldn't sleep last night. <laughs> so. And then they walk out, goodbye, whatever. So, so. Yeah, here we are. It's, it's lunar orbiting and landing. This is, and he, he said, you, you know, the Takubin company here, the black cat company that travels parcels all over Japan. He says they want to be the black cat company between Earth and Moon. Parcel delivery, package delivery, payload delivery between the Earth and the Moon. And that's their system. They will, they will not run rockets. They will buy rides from wherever they can buy rides from. And they will deliver their packages if they can get their lander. Do all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. They will, their, their lander will deliver packages, payloads to the moon. Anyway, I've talked about too much about this. It's nothing to do with blood print making. I'm sorry. But uh, whatever. Look into it. And uh, if you come and visit, maybe you can ask, and I'll show you my patch. <laughs> if you're nice. <laughs> so. That was Dave's news from yesterday. And then, the, like, they left, and I got to turn to somebody else. And the next customer is here, and he says, my story is not so interesting. <laughs> I'm like, okay. It doesn't matter. I'm willing to talk to you, too. <laughs> so. uh, this, this next person had seen how enthusiastic and excited I was about this first one. <laughs> and he may turn out he's a financial analyst, analyst or something like this. So. <laughs> and he was so much, he was funny. And he said, I forget the exact words, but the message was, you know, my story is not so interesting. <laughs> good fun, good fun, good fun. Oh, well. Another funny thing about that story, too, funny as in, hey, really? And it turned out that he's now in his last days with this company, the, the young Irish man, or Irish boy, Irish, Irish guy. He must be about 30, I guess, whatever. The young Irish guy who was talking. And like, I, was, so I must have asked him, like, what's next? What are you going to do next after this thing lands and stuff like that? He said, no, I, I'm out. I'm done. This was the project. I was, uh, I was hired to do this project. And that's it. I'm out, you know. I'm like, like, what? You've been fired? And he said, no, 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 a lot of this stuff is project-based. They take on people to do a specific project. What's over, they're gone. It's contract, contract, contracts. So I said, like, what? You're just out in the streets. He says, believe me, with the knowledge I've got, the experience I've got, I'm not going to have any trouble finding another, another project to work on. And he wants to do it back in, back in Europe. He's Irish, and I guess he's been away from his family for a while. So he's, he, he said, no, cry for me, I'm fine, you know. But uh, it's all, I guess it's all projects. It's all contracted, you know. I don't really know. And he just walks in off the street, and he's like, four guys that built a lunar lander that's actually headed up there right now, you know. It won't be landing, I don't know, for quite a while. It's a couple of months before it lands. It's not like the you know, direct flights with people on. They hit the moon, loop, and land. This thing is looping out to use the moon's gravity to slow them down. It's one of these things where they're really trying to save fuel. So rather than getting to the moon and burning into orbit, they're going to sort of uh, use the moon's gravity to get themselves into orbit run for a while, do some experiments. And I think the landing is scheduled to happen in spring. 
It's uh, April. Well, you've got the web page. The uh, landing, I think, is, is April, March or April. So, so, and Dave will be, uh, Dave will be hanging on tight to see how they do. It's also, I guess it's okay to share this, whatever, part of a private conversation, but I can share it. I said, you know, like, what are the chances of this thing? Because lunar landing is, is not some trivial job. And at the moment, so far, only uh, nations have done this. There's no individual or smaller companies ever managed to do this. And they, the four of them looked at each other, you know, what, what to say to Dave here, how to answer. And they really, I think, they were not sort of 100% optimistic. They weren't blowing away. Yeah, it's fine, it's gonna land, it's okay. They weren't at all. They recognized how difficult this is. And I guess they, they recognized that this may, may not make it down safely. It's their first, their first lander, you know, so. But Dave, for one, will be watching, absolutely. Anyway, sort of talked too much about the same topic here. Nothing to do with our with our you know printmaking, but uh, whatever. This was a very very interesting thing for me yesterday. Very big deal for me, you know. The other thing too is I know I can say this honestly. You know, people that come here to visit us, they've watched our YouTube channel. You know, and f oh, I know, I understand. Soka, soka, soka. Ha 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 ha. You look surprised. I was surprised. I'm sorry. I was surprised. I know. Uh, whatever. It's been. It's been like a bit busy. It's, it's been busy. Uh, busy. Sure. Come say hello. Ah, Remember the lady. This is Ayano san. Come Come Oh, soka. But it looks. It's long. I mean, what do you mean? Was it, it was longer? Much, much longer. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> no idea. One thing I have learned over the years is I never, never, I never would say something. Oh, like you look different because. No, but because oh. in this case somebody might say, "Oh yes, I got my haircut. I'm glad you noticed. This is okay," mm -hmm. but quite often it's not the case. <laughs> or and then, then they're all like, they go cold. This ladies go uh. cold, and I shouldn't have said something. So I've just learned just don't make any comment at all, yes, yes, even yes. polite, <laughs> about the appearance of one of the ladies in the environment. You know. So I'm sorry. So it means I will never sort of notice. I would appreciate it if you noticed. But the point being, it's too dangerous. It's thin ice. You can't walk on this thin ice, you know. So disgusting. Absolutely. <laughs> at, at my age, there's places we just don't go anymore. Yes, <laughs> that's yes, yes. And that's one of them. I guess that's part of it. I hesitated. I saw you come in and something was different. Mm -mm. Uh, so, so, and that's so why, I, oh, I am, son. How are you doing? It didn't, because something was different. Yeah, but you didn't recognize me for a second or something. Mm -hmm. that has, like, you something was different. So, but there's no way I'm going to say anything about that. <laughs> so see. me and every other man in the world here. <laughs> so, <laughs> she looks happy. Do we ask her, what did you do this weekend? <laughs> it was good weather to show. It was good weather. Yeah, yeah. Um, I went to this shrine by bike yesterday, hmm? uh, the sh uh, shrine in Tokyo. Uh, shrine is ma futsu, isn't it? Hmm. Then, well, there was a place where I can have like a green tea and, you know, Japanese hmm. wagashi. Hmm. Hmm. So I sat in the place and just looking at the shrine and mm. enjoying tea and mm. classic so Japanese classic yeah, Japanese yeah. and I found this um, I don't know what it's called in English you know dagashi shop like cheap little snack mm. shop mm. that mm. doesn't really exist in Japan anymore like it's it was everywhere, I think. Yeah, actually, there's, school. A, there's quite a famous one. I think it's probably the same one. They get in the news all the time because they, so it's a, they, an old guy running it, and kids from the neighborhood schools drop by Actually, after school and stuff. No. Yeah, yeah, I mean that was like everywhere in mm. Japan. Like mm. even when I was a high, uh, mm. 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 school okay, kid, yeah, yeah. there was one. But they're gone now, to show. So, but there is one or two still left here. They're kind of so, famous. So, you got the. So. Soka, soka, soka. Not sure if you get what she's talking about. I know, again, when I was a little kid, we maybe sometimes got five cents from our parents or something. We go in this little store, we get our five cents to spend, and you choose the bubble gum or whatever, whatever you do. And here it's dagashi, mm -hmm. and they, like, so like she just said, they don't exist anymore. But there are a couple. There's yeah, one that's actually couple. quite famous. I, I don't know if it's the same one you went to. I don't remember the name. It's near a shrine. It might be the same one. Might be the same Okay, yeah, we, we can look it up later, whatever, yeah, so, 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 so. Yeah. And none of this stuff is healthy food. It's all little sweet stuff. It's gummy bears and, and whatever, you know, it's all just, it's sugar wrapped in different shapes. With so candy or something. Do they sell those still in Japan? Candy cigarettes? Candy cigarettes, isn't it? No way, they still sell those? you got to show us. No way, those have got to be illegal everywhere in the world, surely by now. 
Candy cigarettes, they were really common when I was a kid. They're, they have got to be shut down, totally illegal everywhere, I'm sure. Everybody's waiting for you. Everybody's waiting to see them. Oh, it looks like it's in my house. Oh, she, she smoked them already. <laughs> Maybe. Like, no, but I'm serious. Flavor. You guys tell me, they're illegal, right? Can you still buy candy cigarettes in a candy store anywhere? Yeah, I, I have the image in my mind that no, because you don't want to try like training kids to think that smoking is cool. I mean, okay. smoking has been a, obviously a, for, for decades now. Whoa. You're trying to stamp out the concept of smoking. I did. Or somebody says, here, yeah, you can buy them. Somebody says, no, not in the States. The U.S. still has them. We're getting conflicting information <laughs> here. Only chocolate ones. They sell them on Amazon. Not sure about illegal, but definitely out of style. I really enjoyed it when I was yeah. a kid, you know. Just I bought some in Oklahoma, yeah. Hey. So whatever, whether they're technically illegal or not, I don't know, but certainly they are socially generally now sort of unacceptable, huh. except maybe in, in certain, certain places where they don't care, I don't know. I saw this, come on, yeah. that's an old, old style mm. Japanese mm. snack, so mm. Mm. I saw this, isn't it? <laughs> okay, how much did you spend? You didn't spend 10 yen, right? In the old days, you'd spend 10 yen or something. 10 yen or something. Yeah, it was more expensive, but uh, I bought a lot, mm. so I paid mm. like a yen or something, 600 yen. Big money for kids, yeah. So, so, but I guess kids these days have that money, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I, don't know. Yeah, I just yeah, grabbed yeah, like yeah. a 10, 20 yen, yeah, and went yeah, to the shop yeah. and bought yeah. you know, some snack. And also, I needed to buy a name tag for elementary school, like if I ruined my Name oh, I, back in the day, you mean? Back yes, 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 yes. I thought you were talking about now. Anyways, sorry to bother you. Okay. I know oh, the inbox is not so bad. It's really kind of slowed down now. You know, of course, of course. Uh, we're we're here in the shop. We're in this little bit the winter slump before New Year's and online too. The Christmas thing is pretty much finished now. So, uh, right. so we're done. So you have a quiet, peaceful day. So. Okay. To me, tomorrow, the plan is the video recording tomorrow, so I've got a ton of things to do today to get ready for that, and okay. I might need your help on a couple of them, so sure, sure, I'll sure. let you know. So. Okay. Did you get a mosquito bite or something? You have a red pink spot on your forehead. Did I get a mosquito bite or something? I have a red pink spot on my forehead, she <laughs> says. I don't know. <laughs> you, you will say Bed bugs? I don't know. No idea. Not no bad. Idea. The mosquito. It's <laughs> the so last thing I'm going to worry about. So. All right, see you later. Okay, thank you. Okay, Huh? The box? Oh. Mika. Whatever, we'll, we'll. It's, if it's Aoyama san, it's upstairs. His, his family sends Mikan every winter from uh, Kyushu. Okay. So it's probably for I, I, Aoyama san. Okay. Okay. It might be heavy though, so. so yeah, just leave it. It's okay. Hi. Conversation jumps all over the place today, so. so. Candy cigarettes were banned in the U.S. in 2009, somebody says. I don't know. Anyway, we just asked. So. Oh, I forgot to show her my badge. It's okay. I don't think, she, I don't think she'd be interested. I don't know. Anyway, whatever. <laughs> The Ayana routine is getting stale. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> whatever, whatever, whatever. Okay, settle down, Dave. I tell you, my, my guts are just, just cheering. There's so much going on now. I, I'm so much looking forward to, to when this, this big rush stuff is over. Where were we? Is that the blue garbage truck back, the sound? Is that the familiar sound of our blue garbage truck? Is it visible down there? Yeah, the show.
the box of oranges, she said, that was delivered outside. You saw the mail line come a few minutes ago, and it turns out to be a box of oranges. And I think it's probably, we get an annual present from Aoyama-san's family. They send a box of uh, Mikan oranges from Kyushu. And end of the year, this stuff's flying around all over the place, and we ourselves have been doing it. Ishikawa-san reminded me last week that we need to send a year-end present to our landlady. So I asked her to, uh, to take care of that, and she did. She went to a department store. Uh, to the, and the department stores at this time of year, they have huge, huge long counters. They will set up, maybe it's on the fifth floor, sixth floor, seventh floor, whatever. They rip out half the stuff and they set up just an acre of floor space for year-end gifts. And you go up there, you can do it online, of course, but you go up there and you can see there's a can of, uh, a case of uh, beer cans, a case of juice cans, some sliced ham, a wagashi, you name it, anything and everything is available there. And people go and they pick the specific level of price and style of gift they want. And we sent you know, to our, our uh, landlady uh, a year-end gift, of course. You know, and she phoned uh, the next morning saying, thank you, thank you, thank you, very nice. And this is all completely, totally obligatory. If we didn't send her something, what would she do? She wouldn't do anything. She wouldn't phone us and say, where's my hair and gift? Nobody would do that. But she would feel, are they okay? Are they running out of money? Oh, what's going on? Something, mm. she would feel something is not normal and something is not right. She wouldn't be specifically insulted. She'd be more worried than insulted. And we don't want our landlady specifically worried about us, I don't think, so. Water a bottle of Johnny Walker Red. You could do that if you knew the person well enough. We wouldn't do that for our landlady per se, unless we'd been given a big hint or something earlier about that. Iwano-san, our paper supplier, he sends me a box. It came last week, and he always settles on exactly the same thing. I think years and years and years and years and years ago, he must have sent like a traditional Japanese box of sweets or something. And I probably screwed up. Next time I was seeing him, I said, thanks for the sweets. You know, I don't eat sweet stuff, but it's okay. We'll pass them out to, to the staff or something like this. I would have been stupid enough to say this. And that's it. There would never be a sweet from him ever again. So he switched to sending packages of, uh, from like a ham company. There's three or four sausage mixes. There's, you know, it's 10 or 12 little individually wrapped packs. So when that box gets here every year now, I put it up on the counter upstairs on the third floor, and the staff just takes, uh, takes what they want to go home with, you know. And I phone Iwana son and say, thank you very much. It'll, it'll do my lunches for the next couple of weeks. Thank you, thank you, thank you. you know, so. so yeah, you're in gift giving. It's a thing, I know. Whatever, other cultures have gift giving, you know, overseas right now. A lot of uh, Western countries are, are uh, convulsed by, uh, by the gift giving that's happening over there, some of which is sensible, some of which is obligatory, some of which is too much, you know, whatever. I have no, we have the same thing in Japan. At least here in Japan we don't have this personal Christmas thing. You don't have to get a Christmas present for, for every aunt and uncle and everybody in your family and socks and ties and all that kind of stuff. We don't do that here in Japan. And the gift giving thing here really is a completely, uh, because it goes by such strict rules, there's no doubt and trouble. Like the one I mentioned, do I get a, a socks for Uncle Joe or something like this, you know, whatever. We don't have that problem here because you just simply, you hit the department store or, or one of the shops where they do this thing and you get the thing that everybody expects you to send and it's sent and they, they consume it and there we are. And everybody's happy, the form has been uh, filled, the, the obligation has been taken care of, and there's no doubt about what you have to do. So everybody's happy that way. And none of this stuff is really expensive. The one we sent to our landlady, probably Ishikawa-san would have chosen, I think, Sanzen yen level. If we sent 2,000 yen gift, it would look a bit cheap. If we sent a 5,000 yen gift, it would be too expensive. Why have they done this? What are they trying to say? What's the message? So we would send her a typical gift 2,500 yen, 3,500 yen, somewhere in that area. And she will get that and feel that all is well with the world and everything is normal. But if you underguess it or overguess it, then things start to get difficult. And if you're not sure, 
about what would be a suitable level, the ladies there at the gift center, the department store gift center, they will know what to do. All you got to do is tell them. You know, if I'd have gone there, I didn't do this, Ishikawa san did it, but if I had gone there and said, okay, here's my position, I'm running a company in Asakusa, blah, 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 we're renting this building for a little old lady, blah, 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 blah. I could have just outlined to them our situation. And the ladies there would have said, okay, here, this will be quite suitable, this price level, this kind of object. And they would have just done it for me because it's all so extremely uh, formulaic and decided in advance. And it makes it really, really, really easy. And then, of course, the wrapping, the wrapping, the wrapping. Actually, how's our time? I understand sound came, so it must be getting close to... What oh, it is? It's getting close to our show and tell time. Okay, okay, okay. Waving dude. I miss this guy. I should look up the VOD, I guess. I see these comments in the chat when I read the chat later. There's the waving dude, but I've never actually seen him. I should maybe look into the... <laughs> look into the stored what's the garbage truck he's still there after all these minutes what's going on there he goes the other guys there that you see there's a white truck they're just opening the tailgate these are musicians their head office is upstairs above the coffee shop there there's an old little dance hall I just, so literally, it's a dance hall with a sprung floor and a room, whatever. It's kind of, it's no bigger than our shop here, a bit smaller even than our shop. But it was a dance hall back in the day. And that's where, that's their hangout. They give concerts up there sometimes on Sunday afternoons. They're bringing their truck back, so they must have yesterday. They didn't have their concert here. They had their concert somewhere else. And these are the boys that do the early Showa musical recreations. One of them has an accordion. The other guy is a singer. He grabs, they've got an old-fashioned mic that looks like a microphone from CBS radio in 1927. You know, a microphone that looks like this. And he slicks his hair back with burl cream and he's got these old suits. And they recreate music from the Taisho period and early Showa. It's super nostalgic. And if somebody, a Japanese person my age, somebody who grew up in the 50s and 60s and stuff would have known all the songs that they sing. So they get the, the ladies, the, the middle-aged and elderly ladies just stream all over. They're, they're nice guys. I don't think they have a YouTube channel or anything. I don't know. And they usually have concerts up there Sunday afternoon. And then after the concert's over, the ladies all stand outside and they give them, uh, you know, little gifts and flowers and stuff. Okay, let's have a look at, see if we can find some prints here. I don't even know the name. I don't think they have a name. They just uh, they just do it. I don't know their name. I should look it up. Okay, what have we got for show and tell? We just it's our folder. There's no specific package that has arrived from auctions or something. 
Auctions at this time of year too, they are really, really, really slow. There are auctions out there, I do bid on a few, but it's, there's no uh, wonderful gold mine of stuff. People are just too busy at this time of year to mess around with putting up random little boxes. The dealers are still doing their part of the work, but we don't get at this time of year the random nice little find that just some person found in their, in their house and put up on auction. Where, where did we get to? I don't remember. Well, what's on, what's on tap today? We've seen these two prints. We've seen these two prints. What's next? For a chocolate egg, we've had this series. This is series number four. We have January, February, March, April. The May print is always what kind of shape in the Surimono albums? January, February, March, April. There's the May print from the first set. January, February, March, April. There's the May print from the second set. The third set, and somebody must have it. Fans, chocolate eggs for all those who said fans. It's time for the fans. I don't even remember what it is. Now I remember. This one was fun. This is a composite. Oh yes, I also remember trouble. <laughs> I don't want to tell some of these stories. It makes me look like an idiot. You know the deal about these Surimono albums? The, the thing is, it was for Dave. Let's get this off, it's too bright, washed up. The deal about these Surimono albums, it was for Dave to exercise technical skills and try and learn about different kinds of printmaking. We've got two versions of this one here. We've got a version like this with two little fans on a, on a brown bare background. We have the version with two fans on some kind of, of dirty, messed up background. Dave was trying to learn how to do, look at this, look at this mess. Look at that mess. I was trying to learn how to do uh, mica backgrounds. Up to this point, I had used mica on prints in smaller areas but Dave took an idea that he would try and learn how to do it on a big background. And I screwed up crazy. It's not shomenzuri. Shomenzuri is when you rub and make something shiny. This is, I know, I know, I've forgotten the Japanese word for it. Ow! Oh. It's a mica background, like you see in Sharak prints. They print dark gray and they put mica on top of it and I struggled mightily to do this and I failed. It was only years later, trying it later, that I realized my mistake here had been to put too much on. I, try, I thought that I wanted a deep, rich mica background, so dump it on, brush it out, dump it on, brush it out. It just doesn't work like that. You do your glue, you print the background on a block that just has glue on it, and then you delicately you delicately, what's the word with a sieve, you, you dust some mica over it and brush it out and it makes it look good and rich. If you put too much on, it starts to stick into clumps and it looks terrible. Look at this mess. And I have to say I'm probably, at that time, sending out to customers, I sent out to the waiting fans and collectors some awful, awful, awful prints. I remember actually, they were so bad, I was trying to brush it off and scrape it off and I used a toothbrush. It was a mess, an absolute mess. It would have been better just to do it as a straight, simple background. If I were doing it now, no problem. And in fact, in this book, we will see, I did come back to it and we will see uh, you know, a few streams from now, we'll get to some more mica where I had actually had learned how to do it properly. The other thing about this is the two prints that we see here were not created in that original shape. I need some help. If somebody can go to the Mokohankan collection. Actually, it might be easier just to do it rather than try and ask somebody. Let's do this. I'll go to the collection just a moment, and I have a, the original form collection. Just one sec. I'll look it up for you. Search. Browse by genre, print group, and we have what are called the Hiroaki greeting card prints. If you go to this page, let me get back to the. 
here this page of our collection. It's a page in our collection of a bunch of small little greeting card prints. They were made in batches of thousands here, little small square prints, and they were pasted on the front of little envelopes or little, little folded papers for greeting cards. And they were sold in the stationery shops here. So you get the little prints stuck on a piece of paper. It's folded inside. It says, Merry Christmas, or it says, here in Japan, wish you were here, something like that. And these were sold in the stationery stores here. This is in a pre-war period. I took two of those pictures and I edited them and chopped them and put them into this format. So this is one, another one of those prints. It's assembled by Dave based on traditional pieces. So it's not my woodblock print, but I put it together. And it really does have a nice feeling. You get a good gradation on the mountain. It's so simple. It's so simple. Look at this. A dark gray block, a light gray block, a blue tone, a sky, and a couple of trees. Five blocks, and you can make such a cool little interesting. And this is the, his seal. It's Hiro Aki is the seal of the designer. We call him Takahashi Shote, but his art name was Hiro Aki. And the mountain, the mountain comes up so. Somebody's talking about this. The mountain comes up embossed. If you just leave the white paper and print something else on it, you get the depth of the paper to give you a nice texture. So simple and so clean. I could do this all day long. It's just so much fun. Oh, the other one is fun too, although I don't have the original to compare. No. Okay, I'll try and remember about this. This is a reproduction of a print by an unknown designer. And it really would make sense for me to show you this one and the original side by side. I don't have the original. It's upstairs in a box somewhere. I'll have to go and get it. I'll try and remember to make a list to bring it next time and show you this. Because what this is, this is a reproduction of an etching from the Meiji era. Once you moved into Meiji, printing presses came, stuff came from overseas. The, the printing business in Japan really morphed into lots of different things. Of course, in the Edo era, the printing business was only mokuhanga. That's all they knew how to do. Once the major contact came to the West, printing presses came in, etchings, you name it, lithographs, all different kinds. A little book was published, nothing special, just a little book. I found it in an old bookstore years ago of this kind of imagery in black and white, no colors. Just imagine this kind of imagery, little small scenes, and it was done with some kind of what appears to be etching. When I look at the book under the microscope, I can see the black parts were not printed from rays. They're not bumped down. It's a little etching. And I took a bunch of pictures from this book, and over the years I've used different ones. Some of them are on our hunger club right now, and I did this one for my Sudimono albums. I took the little etching, transformed it into a wood block print, and created colors myself. And this was part of my challenge, because remember, I wasn't an artist, and I'm not an artist. It was Dave's skill to try and say, I could do the workshop part. Give me the design, and I can do all the rest of it by myself. So the coloring that you see here, and the tone and feel and mood of this print are completely what I did, and the line work the, the drawing itself, the little dots and everything like this. This was all part of the original etching. It's a window. It's a window, of course. And the idea is this is a, uh, a uh, what you were, an, an erudite gentleman. And this is his calligraphy desk. We have his brushes and his calligraphy desk, or where he sits to do his, his work on his literary endeavors or whatever, is in front of a round window. And out in the garden, we have a well. And actually, there's a story here. There is a story. This might come from China. 
It's one of those stories. I can't give you the full chapter and verse, but I can give you the outline. There's a person like this, uh, an erudite person. He is maybe like me. His house is a little bit messier than it should be, whatever. Get the idea. You know, he doesn't spend too much time cleaning up. He is in the garden. He needs to get a drink of water from the well. He goes to the well, and this thing you see here, the, the stick going up to the right is the handle of this bucket. You dip it down into your well, and this brings up water. This is not some massively deep well with ropes and stuff. But when he gets to the well, he finds out that the morning glory has wrapped its tendrils around his bucket. And in order to get his drink, he would have to destroy the flower. So you can understand where the story is going. He turns away and stays thirsty. <laughs> it's, I didn't promise you a very dramatic plot, but that is what we're looking at. This is a reference to this little episode somewhere back. I think if you Google this, either in Japanese literary history or Chinese history, you will find these, this, this story. I, I don't think he's going to die of thirst. It's a, it's a Zen episode or whatever. I don't know, whatever. But this refers back to that story. And anybody seeing this print should instantly remember that. Ah, yes, this is the story about the guy who, uh, whatever, couldn't get a drink because he didn't want to disturb the morning glory. There's the modern version of this. They show the woman with the kimono and the cat lying at the end of her kimono. And she wants to get up and go to the bathroom, but she doesn't want to disturb the cat. So she cuts the corner off her kimono <laughs> to do this. It's the reverse version of this. <laughs> That's out there. I mean, just no way, no way, no way. She does this with scissors, chops the corner off this glorious kimono so not to disturb her cat when she gets up to go to the bathroom. <laughs> I would have thought it might have been easier just to take the kimono off, but whatever. Anyway, anyway, okay, that is enough for today. Let's get out of here. I will be off now for three days. It's Monday morning from me. In the intervening time between now and the next stream, if all goes well, if all goes well, we will have video production for me tomorrow, video editing tomorrow night or the day after, and we will have the YouTube update announcing our next year's subscription series, and it will be opening the page for subscribing for next year. So keep your ear to the ground over the next few days if you are interested in getting into one of these subscription series. That's if it all goes well. If it doesn't go well and other things and I get too busy, it will be even later than that. But that's the plan. Thank you very much, gang. I've enjoyed sitting here doing this, chatting with you today. Didn't get a whole lot of work done, about six square millimeters or something. That's all we got time for. Okay, thank you very much. I'll see you three days from now. Thank you again. Before we go, one more thing, one more thing, one more thing, just before we go. I gotta gloat about this a bit more. There you go, Dishel. I'm gonna go up and show Ayano san, and she's gonna say, well, whatever. <laughs> but I don't care. I don't care. There's my patch. Okay, guys, see you soon. Bye for now. <laughs>